Thank you, Badger, for joining me today. Um, for anyone that doesn't know, Badger recently was crowned the best Dude Imperium Uprising player in the world and um, did it with the leader we're going to talk about today, Lady Margot Fenric. Yeah, thanks Thanks for inviting me on. Um, she's really good. And I think when Uprising first came out, I, uh, people looking for things like Paul and Gurney, thinking, oh, gee, they're, they're going to be really good. But Lady Margot really flew under the radar until we started playing the game and... Uh, we got to understand more about how it would work. And uh, with, with Lady Margot, like, looking at her card, it's it's like, oh, two spice if you get the friendship with the Benny. I mean, that's okay. Spies on blue. Do you really want spies on blue? Maybe, maybe not. Um, but the more I play the game, the more I realize how powerful that actually is. And, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to talk about it today. Oh, yeah, I am too. I feel like I am lower on Margot than most, and I think it's one of the bigger holes in my game. I do not, uh, I don't get the appeal as much, and obviously I'm in the wrong because there's been like such a good success rate with Margot. So I'm kind of interested to hear what comes of this conversation and uh, what insights you have to share. Yeah, hundred percent. So, um, did you want me to talk about uh, um, the two spice? Like, I think that's probably the weakest part of the card, and I'm happy to talk about that first if you like. Yeah, yeah. So just to um, read it out, her base ability is called Loyalty, and when you reach two influence with the Bene Gesserit, you get two spice. So like you were saying, pretty simple. It is. And two spice can be really useful at certain times during the game. Um, the issue is going to be is getting to two points in the Benny track can be difficult. In fact, in the final that I just won recently, I didn't even have the Benny friendship at the end of the game when I won. And I actually didn't realize that until I was going over some photos later on going, oh, I never got that. So for me, it's not a huge priority. Um, and that's because early in the game, there's other spots on the board you want to be going to. Like, uh, I think Secrets is um, fairly low priority compared to places like Deliver Supplies, um, Desert Tactics and Frem Kit early on. Uh, and Espionage, you just can't go to until you get Spice anyway. So, um, but, but by the time you come around to turn five or six, sometimes you do need two Spice to get yourself up to five Spice to potentially set yourself up for Highliner. And... Uh, I think that if you, you desperately need spice, it's a good time to get the friendship then to get that two spice. Um, but if you've already got five or six spice um, and you're ready to cook for turn seven and, and you, you've got your spy out, out in Highliner, then you don't really, like, it, it's it's not super important. I mean, you can always use it, but I, I see it as probably the weaker part of the, the card. The leader, yeah. Yeah, I agree. It's a nice bonus for sure. It's um, it's not taking any awards home for great ability. It's interesting your philosophy on it, like it, more of a take it or leave it kind of thing, because I know some players will kind of tackle these bonuses, like Irulan getting to uh, two with the Emperor. People will try to rush that. I remember when Paul was first playing the game with the first one, he grabbed contracts immediately trying to get that extra entry card and trying to get this extra spice. So the philosophy shift of take it or leave it, I think makes sense, especially because Margo does, in my opinion, tend to lean more towards combat as a leader, and the combat leaders are going to be less inclined to go to the Bene Gesserit spots, um, which is an interesting contrast to her kit, in a way. Um, additionally, she gets spies from the ring, so espionage is a little bit weaker for her, and then secrets. It's always been just kind of a middling spot, so it is nice in that it does feed her combat potential with things like Highliner, like Sardaukar, uh, but yeah, definitely not something um, that I'm like chasing in a way no i mean there's cards like uh twisted mentat here and there's there's also several other intrigues as well where which will enable you to go down on tracks um like some of the ones i'm pulling out here now uh and they can really feed into being able to what we call toggle or bounce from this spot and then go back down and come back up to get two spice again um i had a i think it was the fourth game of the um Ran Robin in the, the recent tournament where I had a situation where I think I had this and this both in my hand and I had the opportunity to do that and then use the three spice to come back up. So in, the net impact was only one spice to actually get this because I was able to go down, go back up, get the two spice and and then, yeah, it, it meant that I it was only spending one. So th that was okay, but... Um, typically speaking, I mean, it's it's not really worth the investment. Like if, if I see Twist and Mint out in the starting row and I look at the effect where I go, wow, I can go down and up on the Benny track to keep on getting two spice over and over, um, I don't normally target that. I think there's much more important things to do in the game than to do that. It's a cool trick, don't get me wrong, but um, I think there's, you know, better ways of investing your, your actions and your buying than, you know, trying to set yourself up to keep doing that over and over uh completely agree and there are cards that reveal for spice i think there i can't remember the name of the card the contract card that reveals for two spice 
And obviously that's not rated very highly, so kind of just trying to recapture that with a strong card like Captured Menta that can do so many other things. Um, it's nice to keep in your back pocket, like you're saying, because the extra resources can be very clutch. It's, and these kind of cards are important to keep in mind. But I agree. Um, it's probably not the strongest use. Correct. I'll, if, I'm, if I can grab it, I will. Um, I'm not going to get out of my way to get it, though. It just happens to be, if it's on the way, that's that's nice. The the, the real power of Margo, though, the first the first ability, do you want to read that out? The um the Signet Ring ability, sorry. Yeah, the Signet Ring ability is called Arrakis Informant and allows you to put a spy on a blue spot, which is pretty underwhelming when you're looking at it. You're looking at both of these abilities when you're first playing the game, and it seems like a very simple leader. And I think she's actually, she's given one circle of difficulty, right? Yeah, so by the designers as well, kind of led to be a simpler leader. Yeah, yeah. That's right. And when, when we first started playing the game, we sort of looked at it and going, well, that's, I don't know, it's fairly uneventful. I mean, you, you pick up your spy and you put it out here and go, that's it, is it? Yep, that's it. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, other other leaders are like, uh, you know, getting extra troops or getting drawing cards. But, uh, yeah, no, it is actually really, really strong. And I really want to talk about this because it's it actually really, it is super exciting. Um, so the Signet Ring getting the spy, what that does, as we all know for, through the mechanics of the game, well, hopefully most people know, is it allows you to go to these spots um, and either be able to infiltrate if somebody's already there or to be able to remove the spy to draw the card. And there is a third option, which is to do nothing and just leave the spy there just so it, it remains blocked, um, which you can do also. Um, but what I often use this for is not so much the drawing or the infiltrate effect, but it's the cards that actually interact with spies, which is what I want to talk about. Because as you play more, you'll realize there's some really cool cards um, in the game that actually require you to have spies on the board. And if you don't have spies on the board, they simply do not work. Um, so let's have a look at these six cards, for instance. And I think these are the six power cards for Margo. So what we've got here is cards that do require you to have spies somewhere on the board. Um, this one here, you can get five persuasion, but you have to have two spies on the board. Uh, this one can have three persuasion, but you need to have two spies on the board. Um, Rebel Supply is one of the strongest cards, which we'll talk about shortly, but all these cards need you to have spies somewhere. So when you're looking at a starting row and you, you see cards like this out there, you start to think Margot straight away. Um, but... If you, if you draft these cards with other leaders, and something like Public Spectacle, people do want to draft that card if they can. Um, but if they don't have spies around, it doesn't actually do anything. So um, Margot's already got a head start on other leaders when it comes to being able to um, use cards like these. Agreed. I will say with some of these cards, they're such strong cards that everyone's going to be plowing after them. Um, like... These are all early reveal early. This will get bought up most of the time just because it's so cheap. Usually as soon as this pops up, it's like out the window right away. But uh, Rebel Supplier will rot in the row for a long time. It doesn't have any persuasion. A lot of people don't have the spy generation needed to make good use of it. So you can usually almost guaranteed get this. Although um, during one of the tournament games, I did see two of these hate drafted from the Margo player, which I thought was a pretty heads up play by our opponents. Oh, uh, yeah, no, it was funny. I think it was uh, Carlos playing Margo. <laughs> and he delayed buying this because there were better cars. And he figured, oh, I can come back to it. And then uh, people snatched them up. But then also Imperial Spymaster. Kind of more of a middling card. I feel like this one will usually stick around as well. But yeah, all really good cards, all really effective uses of the ring. So one of my favorite places to go to in Emo was Carthag. Uh, and, and this card here, basically, this will turn one of your blue spots into Carthag. You can go there, you can you can draw your, your uh, Intrigue, but uh, you also get the benefit um, because you're recalling a spy, you can draw a card. So if you go somewhere like Arakeen with this, it just becomes bonkers. You're, you're drawing, assuming you're not infiltrating, you're drawing two cards and getting an Intrigue. And getting a troop and getting to go into combat. That's just the value on it. It's insane. Um, but if you're not playing Margo, um, you like you might be able to go, say, uh, Prim Kid or Deliver Supplies or somewhere else if you've got a spy out there. But you have to have the spy out there. But yeah, Margo, you can guarantee that you'll have a spy lying around somewhere so you can you, you can use it each turn. And if you can happen to get a spy out on the uh, one of the faction spaces, that's still preferable to, uh, preferable to, to use that as a, an, an access card. Mm -hmm. um yeah but uh i mean you've, you've always got an out with it it's interesting though you, you mentioned about rebel supplier where two of these were hate drafted in one game is that right yeah by two different players too wow so <clears throat> rebel supplier is definitely a card i would not early reveal for a margo if it's there in the row i'll take margo but people 
other players generally don't want to get Rebel Supply because if they do, they have to somehow get a spy on blue. Uh, and there's two problems with that. One, if you're playing Margot, you're already putting spies out there anyway. So, you know, they're competing on real estate that you're already taking. And the, the second reason is, like, if someone's generating spies, they should be putting their spies on places like Highliner um, or on or maybe Hugger Basin. Um, if you haven't got Swordmaster yet, or even if it's towards the end of the game and they want to be drawing Spice Must Flow, um, coming up to putting a spy around the Imperial Privilege. If you're putting a spy on a blue and and you're not playing Margo, that that's actually inefficient in my mind. Um, I know people like uh, Fade can probably get away with it a little bit because they get a couple of free spies through their signet ring also. So I, I have played Fade before and picked this up and that's been fine. Um, but if someone's putting that in their deck and they don't have spy generation, then that's actually good for me because they're junking up their deck um, and they're going to have a have a almost a dead card. It's not going to allow them to buy a Spice Must Flow. It does have a Spice and Reveal, which is, means they're not going to get victory points from that. Um, and yeah, to put Spies out here actually requires a lot of work. I mean, you have to go Espionage, then put it here instead of over here. Uh, sorry, yeah, sorry. You, you, you come to Espionage. Oh, my thing's not working at the moment. If you come to Espionage, typically these are the kind of spots you want to go to. So yeah, I, I don't know about that. I, I, I'm quite comfortable if someone takes that off me and I'm playing Margo. That's good. Agreed, yeah. If you don't have a consistent um, source of spy generation, it is really bad. I guess the other situation would be leadership. If you were just trying to fill your deck with daggers, it would be an okay pickup. But yeah, most of the time, you're not uh, you're not feeling great about this. No, that's right. Um, but the Strike Fleet, on the other hand, that, that's a different story, oh, right? Because God, Strike, yeah. Fleet, Strike Fleet, while these spots are combat spots, you need stri uh, a spy in a combat space, so... Either these two over here at the, the Fremen, um, or these blue ones, or even I've I've put strike uh, a spine hugger base and use strike fleet to get a worm, and three troops, which is just disgusting. Like that's that's peak strike fleet right there, um, especially late game. Um, but uh, yeah, with Margo, I mean, uh, once again, you have to have a spy out. If if someone buys strike fleet, I will put a spy here and I put a spy here, then they're down to having to put a spy out on these spots, which once I said is almost suboptimal when you there's other spots you want to put them out on. Um, so, uh, yeah, with Margo though, you, you know, you're going to have a spy out on these blue spots, uh, every time you draw your signet rings. So, you know, that you, when you do draw strike fleet, you're going to be able to come in. You don't have to set up for it where other players definitely have to set up for it and, uh, and can be blocked quite easily. Um, the other one is, uh, I have put, um, a spy over on Highliner with strike fleet. Um, and that's also common because then you can put up to eight troops into combat, um, which can be fairly game winning. Um, yeah. But yeah, once again, you, you got to find the spies, um, which can be difficult. Yeah, agreed. When you are playing um, the ring, which spot do you find yourself prioritizing? And I imagine it's pretty situational, but if you had any like more general advice on it? Uh, yeah, it, it really depends. Um, so I have a look at the row, and if there's uh, a card like Steersman or um overthrow in the row so there's overthrow there and there's steersman here whoops so if you've got one of these two cards sitting out in the row early um i might consider actually putting it here or here and um possibly using research station early to be able to draw three cards if i if i think i'm going to buy this now this wouldn't be turn one because you're not going to get it turn one but if i've got my signet ring in my hand turn one um and i what i'll typically do is i'll buy a prepare the way um because that's an extra true persuasion in my deck, uh, and then what? And especially if I'm going to be drawing into my um, convincing arguments on the second turn. So you got say signet ring in your first hand on turn one. You know your convincing arguments are sitting in your deck. You can come out and put a spy here. Possibly go to deliver supplies with your seek allies first, so you can set up for this. Then turn two, if you've got this in your deck, you, your two convincing arguments coming in. Uh, you can come up here with. Um, Recon if it's still in your deck, um, or you may draw into uh, another blue access if you've shuffled your deck, uh, and, and you can draw three cards, and, and that should just about guarantee one of these two cards. You just have to be careful if you do that, um, that somebody else isn't doing the same thing. There's plenty of other leaders like Irulan, um, Paul, uh, even Gurney that could also be setting up for the same thing. Um, but, I mean, if, if people aren't really setting up for it on turn two, then it's it's pretty easy to get one of these cards. And, and as we know, once you get one of these two cards, you're looking pretty good. If I don't have... Uh, sorry, if one of these cards is not in the row, um, and I typically don't want to waste my water on Research Station early. So uh, I do often go Arakeen early. Um, that's probably my go-to spot between Arakeen and Spice Refinery, um, just because... 
uh, sorry, I'll just move my spy over so we know what we were talking about. Um, the reason being is um, if there's a coin combat that comes out on turn one or two, I typically want to go spice refinery so that I can uh, try and get Swordmaster early. Uh, and if somebody else tries to block me, I can just go there and get my coins whenever I want. That's that's not a problem. Um, but I mainly use it for Arakeen, and the reason I use it for Arakeen is you can remove this. This is the power of Marga. You can remove the spy. Um, you can now draw two cards, which is just as good as, as research station over here, right? Oh yeah. Um, you can you you can you can for just removing a spy, you're getting a troop. So it's basically one less troop than research station, but two less water, and you can draw two cards. And if there's a card like um, a six or seven cost, I've got Corrin City sitting here, which is a good example of a card you might go chasing um even something like uh um in high places or, or strike fleet um or oh, this is another one of my favorite cards uh this is arrakis revolt if there's a card like this in the row that you really want to grab um being able to draw two cards by coming to arakeen um should set yourself up so you should have six buy power um you might need to go up to assembly hall um you might need to go to frem kit um, there's a few other things you may need to do. You might even need to go accept contract. But typically, drawing two cards in Arakeen, you should be able to get um, a, a really good card. Um, the second thing that does, though, is by going to Arakeen and drawing those two cards, I mean, you've only got 10 cards in your starting deck. You get rid of uh, Seek Allies, you're down to nine. So if you're drawing two cards, that's that's seven cards you're seeing in a round. So you're going to be cycling your deck very quickly. So any good card that you do buy is going to potentially end up in your hand the following turn. Um, and that's what you want to do with Margo. That's why Margo is powerful. You want to get these card, these six cost cards, even an eight cost card, um, something like Strike Fleet, and you want to cycle them and play them every single turn. Um, I know that I've had Strike Fleet in my deck sometimes, and I just keep going Arakeen with Strike Fleet for four troops. Uh, I'm drawing two cards on top of the four <laughs> troops, uh, and then the, the following turn, I'm like, oh, I got Strike Fleet again. I just get Signet Ring, Strike Fleet, Signet Ring, Strike Fleet, and uh, by the by round five, people are sick of you. They're over you. They're like, oh, why, why, are you, why are you drawing <laughs> that card every single turn? Even uh, Rackers Revolt, you can like if you break break your uh, get your hooks early, like you can just go to a, a blue spot. You can't be blocked. And if you've got the spice coming in, like uh, through win some of the combat rewards, um, yeah, you can just be putting a worm in every time without even having to go to hug a basin. You don't even need water. Uh, it's it's just it's just broken. So um, the only other time I'll, I'll put the spy, uh, which is over here, this is probably only if I want to get worms. So the person sitting before me is also going to get worms, and they've they've got access to Siege Tabber, and I feel like they might be blocking me on Siege Tabber. It's it's quite a common tactic where. If someone does is the first to get worms, um, rather than going here first action, they'll just go here and stop other people getting worms and just keep collecting water. They get enough water, eventually they can come deep desert if they want, so you can no longer block them there either. So Margo, you can't be you just put your spy here and you can get worms whenever you want. You can no longer be blocked, which is, is also very powerful. Yeah, agreed. And I find um in a lot of games, especially if players are a little bit more inexperienced, this ends up being a very popular spy spot. And if someone else gets their spy here and leaves it here for a while, it can shut down some of the things you want to do. So I, I do like um, putting it there early and um, cycling it out and kind of having your spy on that spot just to discourage other people from putting it there. I know you said that it's uh, considered more inefficient, but I do find people uh, like putting their spies there. Uh, if someone was to put their spy there, that's great. That means their spy is not somewhere where it could really hurt me late game, like on Highline or Hugger Basin True. or even on Fremkit, right? You know, um, go and put your spy there. That's that's fine. It's good for me, right? I can, <laughs> I can, you know, I can go with Espionage at some other point and I can put my spies, you know, on, on more efficient spots. But the other thing is with Siege Tabber, um, especially, uh, uh, it's never bad to be able to get like your hook. If you've already, even if you've already got your hook, you're still getting a ward, you're getting a troop and you're getting to draw a card if you pull your spy back as well. So, um, and w like I said, the power with Margo is the ability to cycle these good th cards through your deck. Um, so I, I don't really mind which spot it's on as long as it's a spot I want to go to uh, and I want to keep on pulling that spot to keep on cycling. Um, you typically don't want to infiltrate. Infiltrating is bad um, because it means you're not drawing a card. Uh, and if you're not drawing a card, you're not cycling your deck, which is why I typically won't um, pull the spy uh, just to, to infiltrate someone, unless it's to get like hooks and I really want to get hooks, for instance. Yeah. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And uh, especially on your point of just getting these combat loops going over and over again with some of these more powerful combat cards and getting the combat rewards as you go as well. That's definitely a way you can snowball games pretty quickly and keep them going. 
And I also just really like the um, idea you were saying of drawing through your deck, recycling through it. It's what made Ilban so powerful in the old expansion. Um, just the ability to get dig through your deck as quickly as possible. And there are definitely more draw spots in Uprising. Uh, the only problem is they are pretty popular spots, especially from Kit. Maybe not towards the end of the game, but except contracts will be hit a lot with people with dead draws. And bailing the ability to bail yourself out of a bad draw is also a... Uh, a big benefit, especially in the late game. If you draw pretty dead, if you have, if you at least have blue access and you can get a double draw from Eric and you can get a one draw from Siege Tabor, sometimes that can enable you to get into those power cards when you really need them at the end. So yeah, I agree with everything well, you said. Yeah. Uh, it's it. Yeah. Two things on that. One thing you mentioned was uh, Ilban and I, I did have that in my uh, notes to talk about that because uh, as people know, going mint up with Ilban was uh, very common. Um, in uh in immortality and uh, unfortunately met that spot takes a little bit of setup costs a little bit more uh it's not quite as easy as what it was in immo so you're quite right like the, the ability to cycle your deck like ilban used to is is very hard to do but with margot she can actually do that um and the second thing is about the bad draws like if you even if you get your rebel supplier you get say two daggers a convincing argument and even a spice must flow late game i mean to have a bad draw and be able to go to Arakeen, get three troops, draw two cards on a bad draw, I mean, <laughs> there's nothing bad about that. That's that's amazing. So as, as long as you've got blue axis, you can normally draw yourself out of a problem. Um, unless someone picks up that you might be in a bit of a spot of bother, they're looking at your uh, discard pile, they're looking at what you might be drawing next turn, they try and block you, that can be super frustrating too. Yeah. Um, actually, that's something I want to talk about, was uh, the le like how you counter Margo. Um because I think you touched on uh, people putting their spy up on Arakeen to try and block Margo. Yep. And I think that's a, that's a good tactic. But even early game, if you um, see someone else has already picked Margo, um, leaders like Fade are actually very good at countering Margo just because they've got spy generation as well, or even Staban to ex an extent. So you can actually start dropping spies around here to actually block Margo. And I've actually seen some games where I think there was... Might have been a Margo in three, and the Staban was position one, and position two was um, Fade, and the other players have just put all their spies on the blue spots and just refused to remove them. And <laughs> if someone, if if three players decide to do that to you and you're playing uh, Margo, well, you're probably going to have a fairly miserable game. But uh, please, if you're playing against me, don't do that because that'll uh, make my life miserable. <laughs> yeah, that sounds incredibly frustrating. <laughs> yeah. Uh, which I don't mind, once again, I think there's better spots on the board that people want to put their spies, but uh, I mean, it, it certainly can be frustrating as a Margo player when you're playing your Signet Ring and you can't put your spy out because that, that's the power, right? Yeah, I think there's definitely good scenarios for a table to form a fellowship and do something like that. It's kind of like the guild spy scenario where people want to fill up all the faction spots. If Margo gets something like Strike Fleet, like one of these really strong spy um, uh, synergy cards, I think blocking up the blue spots is a really effective... Um, strategy if you can coordinate it on the table that requires a lot of coordination and setup it um and it, only, and it only takes one person to go you know what that was a great plan but no i'm not going to play my part because i'm going to do something else and you uh, <laughs> and the yeah. whole thing comes <laughs> crashing down because then margo gets inspired anyway and everybody else has been setting up going to spots like F espionage just to uh which is this one over here just to try and s stop margo and yeah, it, it, typically it's very hard because this is the thing margo um can get spies other ways and just drop them in other spots. And then you're like, well, I guess, I guess we haven't blocked it after all. Um, and there's also cards like, um, oh, I didn't, wasn't going to talk about it, but we will talk about it. Um, like there's cards like uh, Distraction, which enables you to uh, be able to put a spy anywhere on the board as well. So there are other ways of being able to get spies out if you need to. Um, so it's, it's, it's not a foolproof strategy, unfortunately. So you spoke about one, one um, early game move combination which if there is a really strong card hitting deliver supplies getting a spy down with your ring onto a research station adjacent spot and then hitting research station for the draw after buying um prepare the ways any other early yeah, game move buy. combinations you find yourself doing with margo that you find effective uh i think the thing with margo is that she's flexible so there's not really a oh when you play margo you do this combo early game um I go into a Margo game and my strategy is very open as to what I want to do. Um, but typically it is depends on what's in the row here. Um, if I see cards that are combat related in the row, um, like I'll typically try and draw cards 
early by going to Arakeen so I can buy them. But if I see that the rows not really much is going on in the row, then I might actually just try and set up to try and get worms if I'm in position to do so, um, rather than trying to draw cards. So, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I, I'm not. Yeah, I don't don't want to say this is how you play Margot turn one or turn two because I I don't think there is a way of doing it. But I think like Gurney and uh, Gurney is one of the other heroes I play a lot. Um, because he does get that extra buy power. I use Margo in a similar way where, okay, I know I can get a spy out. I know I can draw an extra card. Um, I know I can cycle my deck fairly quickly. So I, I want to try and find good cards in the row and try and increase my buy power as much as I can um, so that I can prepare myself for, uh, you know, um, having a really good deck. And, and then just, if you've got a good deck, you should be able to beat the other people who, who might not have a strongest deck. Yeah, I think, uh, I don't think there's any best strategy either. I think they... Margot is pretty flexible and can adapt to different situations. Um, if you get a disaster draw where you draw no faction access and your hand is kind of terrible, there are I don't I don't even know if this is that great of a a path, but it is a path to early swordmaster where you hit uh, around one Haga Basin like Staban would do. If you can hit Spice Refinery with your ring, put a spy down, guarantee Spice Refinery access for next round and get a turn two swordmaster. I think that's a nice combination you can do. It would depend on your opponents not recognizing that you're going Haga Basin and intending to hit Spice Refinery as your second move early on, but uh, I think it can be fine if you find yourself with um, without faction access or better things to do. So, so with Margo, I will... Yeah, if there's nothing in the row to buy, I'll do that under limited circumstances, and that depends on what this card is here. What's this one today? So with this one, I wouldn't do it. Um, but the other two tier one combats, I don't even know where they've gone. But um, <clears throat> you'll find that the uh, the other two have coins on them. So um, the the mouse one, I think, gives two, three, and two coins. So if if that is the combat, uh, and I can come here to put, you know, get some sort of rewards out of the combat, um, then you know the following turns, you've already got two coins, or potentially even three coins. Uh, you can come up here and you're up to six, and then you're on your way to getting Swordmaster. So I will do it then. But if if it's this combat here, and then the tier two combat comes out, uh, maybe not so much that one, but it will definitely not that one. <laughs> if it's something like this comes out, um, then I'm probably not going to do that. Um, I'll, I'll try and avoid going Spice Refinery. But if if the first co uh, so even if the second combat's something like uh, this one. So if this comes out tier two, I'm trying to get the spice refinery ASAP. I've got to get spice. I've got to come here. This is my priority now. And the reason being is if a card like this comes out, people are going to get rewards out of this. People are going to be filling up their coins. And if people are filling up their coins, people are going to go, wow, I can just go to spice refinery and get my swordmaster next turn. And you don't want to be last to get swordmaster. You, you can't get a spy up here um, without going somewhere like espionage. Um, so... Uh, yeah, and you don't, and because getting an early swordmaster gives you so many more actions, you don't want to be getting around seven, eight, nine, and people having their swordmaster on turn two or three. You're going to be six or seven actions behind, and you're not going to win the game. So, yeah, as soon as I see something like this as a Margo player, I'm okay. I've got to come here. I don't care if it's blocked. This is now my strategy. I need to get my swordmaster as soon as I can because if if I don't and I'm last as swordmaster, I'm probably not going to win the game. But that's where if uh, other combats come out, like even this one here. Um, it's going to be harder for the table to get coins. If, if people can't get coins on the table, there's less incentive for somebody to try and burn their way to eight um, just to get their Swordmaster. And that's especially true for Margo. Yes, Margo can come here twice to go up here, but what you're doing is making the Swordmaster spot cheaper for everybody else. And you've wasted effectively your first two rounds of the game getting your Swordmaster, you know, where other people won't have to put as much effort into doing that. You're much better off putting your effort into trying to draw in a really good card out of the row um, and only doing this if, if the combat's come out and there's coins involved. Yeah, agreed. I think that makes a lot of sense. Okay, so with the, um, just going back onto the drafting, as I've been, uh, that seems to be a theme. You want to get good cards in your deck. And the deck building aspect of Margo, you have to be super disciplined about it. Uh, the reason being, like, yeah, you can come up here, you can draw two cards each turn um, with your, using your signet ring. Um, you might come to Fremkit, draw some more, start cycling your deck. But if you draft poorly, as in cards that are just what I call junk, you're going to have a deck of up to 15 cards, and you're not going to be able to cycle through your deck. With 15 cards, even if you're coming to Arakeen, it's going to take you up to three rounds to actually cycle your deck, and you're just not going to see the good cards. You may have even set up well for a research station. You get a good card. I mean, this is great, but if you only play it twice for the game, it's terrible. So with Margo, when I am uh, playing her, I often do like coming to Desert Tactics round one to be able to cut a card out. 
Um, what that enables me to do is it's just one less card floating around my deck and I can, my cycle time is a, a, a lot better. Um, but the second thing I do is with the cards in the row, I, like, things like this I see as an absolute trap. It might look good, except what it's doing is it's junking your deck up with another card that you have to draw to find another good card like something like this in your deck or even something like this card. Like, this is a good example of a card you want to be seeing as much as you can just because even if you don't have the coins, you can get coins. Um so I have a general rule of thumb here, uh, and that is that in any given game, what I try and do is I'll try and cut a card early with Desic Tactics, or if a combat comes out where it's, um, I don't know where there's one here, but there are st a combats where you can actually trash cards. Um, I'll be looking for those. Um, so I want to try and trash one, maybe two cards. And if I can do that, I'm, because you get rid of Seek Allies as well, Seek Allies, two cards gone, you're down to seven starting cards in your deck. Then what I want to do is uh, I want to pick up a good faction access card, uh, maybe another good faction access card. I consider this a faction access card, and I'll talk about that soon. Uh, and then I want to try and pick up maybe two other cards. Maybe that you can get this one if you want, but I probably wouldn't. Or something like this. Um, so so that way, if I've got say these cards here, these four cards in my deck, uh, plus my other seven cards, it's only eleven cards. So with 11 cards in my deck, I'm able to cycle through fairly consistently seeing these cards probably two out of three turns. Um, but, but that's a trap for newer players. Like you'll, If you think, oh, I've got a three buy pair, I'll just buy this. Well, that gives me a spy. That's okay. And you know, then someone's like, oh, another diplomat. That's a good card too. And then you end up with like 13, 14, 15 cards in your deck. You, you're going to be trapped in that you're not going to be able to find you know, the actual cards that are going to win you the game as much as you need to. And you're going to be stuck with other cards that – well, good. I'm not going to be winning anything. So do you find yourself passing on a lot of early buys then? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Well, that's the thing. I can buy, I typically get prepared away, but there's something else with two persuasion. I might, I don't like this card much, but I might get it. Um, cards like this. I think this is fine. I think this is good. Uh, so, and these, because they're, they're both faction access cards, they generate more spies, which is good for Margo, which can really power other cards that might come out, such as, I'm not going to find them going through the deck that way. I'm going to find them because they're over here. Um, so if, you, if you're drawing cards that have got spies on the bottom, um, you can never have enough spies, because that way if something does come out um, eventually like this, or like this, you're like, oh, okay, cool. I've I'm got spies coming out of my ears. Uh, I'm in a good spot because I did draft cards like this earlier that have got the spies in the bottom. Um, but yeah, I will often pass if the row just isn't going to help me um, too much. The other thing I often do, and this is a bit of an advanced play, is if I'm in position four as Margot, I'll still set up for a, possibly a six or seven buy on turn one, and particularly turn two. And the reason being is if people are going to be buying stuff out of the row, I know they will be, so I know that there's cards that are going to come off the top. So we'll just do a random selection of cards here. Let's have a look at three cards off the top to see what's coming out. And you'll find that typically there's going to be a pretty decent card that's going to come out. We can do it again if you like. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is just random, right? This isn't me setting it up or anything. So one, two, three. Oh, hello. There we go. Yeah. Another good one. Yeah, we could do this all day. So as Margot... Don't be afraid to gamble because you, your odds are going to be looking pretty good. Do you want to keep doing this? is a fun game. <laughs> uh, it's actually hitting every time too, and it's always one. <laughs> yeah. I'll get unlucky at some point. No, yeah, those two. Yeah, you can take those. See, six by gets me both of those. Hey, I'm, I'm in heaven if that happens. One, two, three. Ah, oh, we got a blank. Uh, and that'll there happen. It is. Although yeah, I'd, buy, I'd, buy, I'd, buy, I'd buy this one. Yeah, and then that that happens. But then if the row turns are junk, sometimes that happens. That's actually a really good card. That's You know, I was talking about I'll buy two cards that will not have faction access. Yeah. Um, that's like Rebel Supplier, like these, I'll buy these two cards as my two filler cards that don't have faction access, and I will not buy any other cards. And these two together are just, yeah, it's like Strike Fleet. Uh, they just work really well together. But uh, this thing, if I get these two and something like this comes out, I, I won't buy this. It's too many cards in your deck. You need to be very disciplined in making sure there's only two non-faction access cards you buy. Something like this is fine. That's faction access. Something like this is fine. Faction access. Whoops. Something like this is fine. Faction access. But the non-faction access cards, you're really going to be disciplined. Maximum two. Wow. That is incredibly disciplined. I would have a very hard time passing up on Catch and Menta. I would definitely blow my deck up. And uh, it's interesting to hear your perspective on it. And it's also, I really like your... Um, 
I guess, your thought process on passing on a semi-dead road that has decent cards, but not the cards you're looking for in favor of a prepare the way because these are really solid cards especially for margo because like you were saying before uh cycling through your deck is such a strength and this is a guaranteed card draw if you can get to two influence which you're already incentivized to do as margo anyway um and this being able to hit eric draw two cards plus a third card for this it can really get your deck cycling so it's an early card you buy that doesn't become dead as the game goes on which i think is nice yeah yeah i i, I agree i think in the uh fourth tournament game i was playing margo or it might have been fade but i'm pretty sure it was margo because i had a spy sitting on arakeen and one of my dead draws um was uh i actually took a photo of it because it's so ridiculous it was turn turn seven and i had to buy a spice must flow to win the game and i had i think it was two daggers a convincing argument a june the desert planet and a spice must flow so I'm sitting, looking at my hand, I've got two Persuasion total with five cards, and I have to find a way to buy a Spice Must Flow. Um, I had some of these intrigues that uh, I was showing you earlier, where I had, I think I had, um, I th I'm pretty sure I had this one in my hand. So I was able to shift up here to actually get a Spy out. I actually put the Spy in Assembly Hall, and I used my Dagger to come up here and actually um, remove the Spy to get an extra one Buy Power, and also draw a card. And the card I actually drew, funnily enough, was prepare the way and i had a spy on arakeen so then i went prepare the way arakeen drew three cards drew the drew i think five total which i think i had one up here plus a convincing argument in my hand already and it was enough to be able to um yeah to get me to nine i needed to uh to buy the spice must flow so you're 100 percent correct there that that prepare the way combined with arakeen and a spy it's just it's it's a very feels good moment especially when you're trying to draw back into a decent hand yeah and when you are trashing early for Desert Tactics, usually Dagger, or do you um, mix things up more? Or? So if I've got a Rebel Supply coming into my deck, um, I'll often trash the Recon. Okay. Um, because I don't really want two blue cards in my deck. I mean, keep in mind, Signet Ring's not unlimited spies. It's one spy every time you play the Signet Ring. And if you're drawing cards and you go Arakeen, there's a very good chance you might draw your Signet Ring and go, ah, oh, I needed to put another Spy out. That's not good. So it's not unlimited Spies. It's just you, you you can probably allow probably four, maybe five tops times in the game you'll be able to put a Spy out. Um, so if, if that's the case, you've got four or five Spies up on these blue spots, it means there's four or five times you're going to be able to come up here. Now, if you've got Recon in your deck and Rebel Supplier in your deck, or even a, like a Strike Fleet for that matter, or even like this one here, this is I love this card so much, then... You've got cards you're wanting to go with these blue actions anyway. You, you want to go here. Act, they call, I call them active. So they're active cards where you want to play the active effects and you want to go to these blue spots. So if you're doing that, what's your recon doing in your deck? Not much. It needs to go because it's just another card that you're going to be seeing. And when you do see it, you're like, well, there's no way in the world I'm ever going to play it because I've, I've got blue access cards already. Um, even if you get to prepare the way and you're, you're looking like you're going to get that, that's that's another card you could possibly use to go up here. So uh, Recon's often the first to go. Um, if I don't have Recon on my deck, it will be a, a dagger. Um, but yeah, typically it's not always a dagger. Um, so just on that also about the, the uh, limited amount of spies where you're going to get four to five in a game up here because you're signaling, that's another reason why you don't want to buy two Rebel Suppliers because while it might seem amazing, if you've got one signet ring and two Rebel Suppliers, you're going to see your signet ring once and these twice. You're going to put your spy out here. You're going to draw two of these and go, oh, hang on. So it's it's not that good. Unless you pick up a card like this, and then it can be kind of bonkers where you can put extra spies out. But typically speaking, unless you've got spy generation like this, you, you don't want to pick up two rebel suppliers or you know, even a rebel supply and a strike fleet. It's just, it's just greedy. You'll find yourself selling yourself short on spies and you'll um, have to reveal some of these. Realness is good, but yeah, it's, it's a situation you don't want to try and get into. Yeah. And um, what are some of your like mid game goals as you're going through this? Are you usually trying to get your Swordmaster online ASAP? Are there times where you're trying to, I don't know, like what, uh, like what pairs do you find yourself taking through the mid game? So that comes down to what combats are coming out. Yeah. Um, if the combats are coming out and they've got coins written all over them, turn one, two, three, then you're absolutely working towards Swordmaster. If turns one, two, three, there's no coins written on the combat cards, like this one comes out and uh, not that one. Uh, well, I don't know what I've done with them. I've shuffled everything up now. Everything's all over the place. Here we go. So if cards like this are coming out, then I'm I'm typically not going to go for Swordmaster because I know that if somebody else wants to go up there, it's going to mean that they're not going to be going combat, um, and that enables me to take some premium spots 
that um, if I was going Swordmaster, I wouldn't be able to take. Um, so with Margo, um, I typically am still trying to get the Worms online because I know I can't be blocked on Siege Tavern. Prem Kit, Desert Tactics, especially Desert Tactics from Margo, they're they're my spots I like to go to. From Kid, especially if um, there's a good card in the road, I really want to go here with Seek Allies, draw another card, um, and just try and set myself up for a turn two buy. Maybe even turn one if you've got the right hand. Um, but, uh, yeah, once, once it gets to mid-game, though, by that stage, um, I should have some good cards in my deck. Now, you're not going to get Strike Fleet every game. If you get Strike Fleet, you're probably going to win. It's just that good. But yeah. if you've got a card like um, Current City, I see is a fairly middling good card. Um, or even in a card like this. Yeah, th at that stage in the game, I want to be trying to see these cards as much as I can. So um, I'll be doing what I can to draw cards, but at the same time, I'm trying to set myself up for late game as well. And to set myself up for late game, what I need is I need a spy over here on the um, spacing guild um, and possibly even a spy on Hager Basin if I've got worms. Or deep desert if I've got water. So it's really just a set up at that point for the end game, because I know that come around turn seven, I I'm confident I might be able to pick up three, four, possibly even five points just from combat. Um, so I, yeah, I just really want to make sure I'm picking up my friendships um, because they're four free points. Whoops, why is this not working? So try and pick up my friendships um, to get four points here. Um, try and cycle my deck so I can actually get into combats, win combats. Um, and you'll find that with a lot of the combats, um, they do have faction bumps. So part of me getting friendships isn't just going to these spots here. Part of them is also just trying to win these combats here um, to, tr to try and get my friendships that way. Especially if you've got a worm in. I mean, that's that's just, you know, that, that's really good. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, it's just, it's just a, that's the thing with Uprising. It's different to Emo. Emo, you were always just trying to, to get points throughout the whole game where Uprising... It's just really a setup. You you just got to spend the middle turns just setting yourself up, making sure you're within striking distance, making sure that you've got a deck and also position on the board so that you can go in hard when that turn seven rolls around and you can win that. And if you can win that, you're in a, a good position to win the game. Um, and, and Margo just does that very well. Yeah, and kind of coming back to what you were talking about earlier with deck composition, getting those faction access cards to guarantee that you can get Highliner access because... If you do all the work, getting all the resources you need for the lake in combat, but you don't draw the access, you are still uh, not gonna, you're not gonna win that combat. So I think um, like the whole game plan top to bottom does align with that goal of setting yourself up to get those late points. And we kind of yeah. touched on this already, but do you find yourself going mostly for combat-based victories slash strategies with Margo? Uh, it depends on the row. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. It depends. It depends on these three cards. All right. Yeah. What's what's my what's what's my strategy going to be today? Oh, okay. I guess I'm going combat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that that's how it works. Um, yeah. and and that's why it's it's so flexible. And, and this is why I pick Margo pretty much any time. I I pick Margo. I like I say to people, when do I pick Margo? Well, when do you eat chocolate all the time? It's just it's just tastes so good. So uh, yeah, I because I know that you know if if these cards don't come out and it's something else that comes out, you know, I can I can adjust my strategy around it. So, uh, they're all rubbish. Um, but um, one of the things I was going to mention about uh, the um, I was going to talk about is what happens when the row doesn't come up and you end up with bad cards as Margo because that's that's her power right so if you're not buying good cards and somebody else is um, you can be in a bit of trouble but I think that's where if you realise the row is not looking that good um, like I'll often pick up cards um, oh I just had one of them there before I'll I'll start to pick up combat based cards. Um, just so that I can actually push through, win combats, get my bumps that way. Because cards like, oh, not so much that one, but you know, cards like these ones here, like you can, if you don't find the faction cards in the row that you really want, and it is just junk down here, like things like this thing come out, um, then you, yeah, you can still win combats to get your bumps. You don't necessarily need to draft combat cards. So in the um, final, which I'm guessing will be shown soon um oh, that i won the only faction card i drew for the whole game was this one that was it and i think i had what have i had an alliance on fremen and i had a friendship here and a friendship yeah friendship spacing friendship info so I, re I really had a tough game that game where i wasn't able to get any faction cards at all but because i was able to get the spy up here through the mid game um i knew i was still going to be able to come up here and in fact i ended up getting a spy up here as well so I actually use this spot up here 
um, with this card here and my diplo diplomacy went here as well. But one of the reasons I was able to do that um, was turn six I had, uh, I looked in my discard pile and I realized in my discard pile was this card here and my diplomacy. Um, and I knew, knew that if I didn't cycle those cards back into my draw pile, come around turn seven, I wasn't going to be able to to go to these spots that I needed to go to. Um, so that's a good thing as Margo. I'm like, righty, time to Margo up. Turn six, I need to shuffle my deck ASAP. That's that's my goal. I had cards still in my draw pile, so uh, I think I went over to um, Imperial Privilege with the uh, Undercover Agent, which would, enabled me to go there because I didn't have the two bumps here yet. Um, I went to Arakeen and I started cycling so that I could reshuffle my deck to make sure that I had my, let's pretend that's a Diplo. So when I got around to turn seven, I had these cards ready to draw. But if I hadn't have been Margo, I wouldn't have been able to do that. So that's that's the thing. Even if you're Margo, you don't have a great deck. Um, people, Other people are getting some good faction access cards. You can cycle. You can see your diplomacy a lot more than other people typically. Yeah, and if you're doing the uh, early trashing as well, you can cycle back into it even faster, which um, kind of plays back into that as well. And, of course, Wheels Within Wheels even nicer if you do have your two spies here just because you can get those kind of resource generation. But, uh, yeah, and um, I guess also we kind of already touched on cards that are good for Margo. Um, do you find Margo to be better in any specific position based on opening turn order, whether or not there are certain leaders around you, or do you think she's kind of flexible in all positions. Mm, there are definitely leaders that depend on position, but Margo is not one of them. Yeah. Um, I, th I think that if people, you can see what people have picked behind you and you're in position one. I mean, position one Margo is great if there's a good row because you, know, you can, um, you, you know that, okay, well, I'm just going to draw cards, turn one. I'm going to try go deliver supplies and uh, research station if you want, if there's a, like a, a really good card like Strike Fleet out in the row. Um that being said, if there's Strike Fleet in the row, someone's probably going to early reveal for it. But probably. I mean, yeah. you. But even if there's a like a a middling card in the row, um, where's that? My favourite middle card that I was showing before the um, I don't know where it's gone now. I'll find it later. Um, but uh, Current City. Um, so there's card like Current City or, or Charney is another good example of a, a middling card. I know that position one Margo, I should be able to get the five to. To, to buy that and then I can start cycling and I'm, I'm feeling really good. If I'm not in position one and this is in the row and I feel somebody else is going to buy it, um, it's a bit more tricky. Um, but that being said, like I, like I said before, you can set yourself up for turn two, knowing that there's probably going to be some half decent, all the decent cards are down here now, so we're not going to see them, but there's you know, probably going to be some pretty decent cards that are going to pop out on the row that you, you should be able to take advantage of. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's uh, position three or four. Position four will often reveal early with Margo um, because uh, how strong um, like her, her deck cycling is, as we've discussed. Position two, the good thing with Margo is if there's a seven or eight cost in the row, um, you're not going to get it turn one. No one's going to get it turn one. Turn two, though, you're going to be first to buy out of the row because you'll be revealing first. So position two, Margo is fantastic. Um, okay. I really like it. Okay. Yeah, I agree. I, I couldn't think of any reason to uh, pick Margo in any specific spot around the board. And even in an opening pick scenario, I think the only leaders, kind of like what we talked about earlier, that could be a little bit of trouble for Margo would be Stabon, would be um, Fade as well. Leaders that can kind of disrupt with spies. But they usually want to be putting spies elsewhere anyway. So they do have to sacrifice a little bit to, uh, to block where you want to be putting spies. So it's usually not too big of a deal, even in that regard, uh, I found. Yes. If Stabarn's putting in their first spy on Arakeen, I'm just smiling like a Cheshire cat. I'm just like, <laughs> yeah. you, you do that, buddy. <laughs> it's it's compl it's suboptimal, and I think anyone who starts playing suboptimally to try and block you um, is not going to win the game, um, yeah. which is fine. You're still going to win the game, and they're making your life difficult. But that you know, in my mind, and I've said this before to people, and they don't, I don't. Know, it's a bit um, controversial, but winning a game's not about being the best player and coming first. It's just making sure that the other three players don't win. So. <laughs> if Stavan's doing that, well, I'm down to two people I need to beat now. And if I can, you know, take take someone out of a combat at, at an opportune time um, and someone goes, you've just wrecked my whole game, I'll be like, cool, I'm down to one now. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, um, it, it, it's not a very feels-good moment. And Uprising does have some of those moments where it's, oh, that, that didn't feel really good. Um, 
I remember poor old CJ. I, I really got him in the the first game of the tournament where uh, I had an intrigue that allowed me to get a bonus water and steal deep desert bonus spies off him. And um, oh no, <laughs> it's a feel, it's a it's a feel, it's a feels bad moment. But that that's the thing. It's uh that that's uprising. Yeah, yeah, it's part of what makes it fun. Some of those moments are hilarious when they happen. I I thoroughly enjoy it. Yeah, me too. No, I really enjoy it. Any other information you want to discuss about Margot? Anything that um, I didn't ask you about or you think that's important? Uh, I think that Margot's S tier. If, if we're looking at Margot having a tier. Yeah. Is that, is that all right? We'll talk about that. So, um, yeah. Because I don't know whether... Um, this is the thing. I, I'll be honest. I've only played Jessica one game. So <laughs> compared to other leaders, <laughs> I mean, I played probably like 300, 400 games of Uprising. I've played Jessica once. And there's, I think that's Irulan and might have played like three times. Um, yeah, so uh, it's hard for me to like compare it to other leaders when I just don't play them. But based on what I know that Margo can do, I, I can pick her up and I know that no matter what the, what the game throws at me, whether it be... Um, yeah, combats or intrigues. Um, that's something else we didn't talk about, the intrigues. Oh, yeah. These. yeah let's talk about it. Wow. Look at this. So <laughs> we got this. This. What else we got? Oh, we got this one too. Um, that's on intrigue. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but this is the thing. Like, there's there's cards that... Uh, actually, there's another cool one as well that um, is relatively useful, um, if we can find it. Um, so these intrigues here, they require you to have spies to work. And if you don't have... Um, you don't have spies. They don't do anything, even this one to an extent. So I've seen uh, a game I just played recently, actually, where someone had Spring the Trap and Turn 7 Combat rolled around. If you've got this in your hand, Turn 7, you're you're feeling real confident. They didn't have the spies. They didn't have any ways of getting spies. They didn't have oh, any cards no. like this in their deck. Uh, they, they couldn't get to espionage because it kept on getting blocked. And they just, yep, I'll, I end up winning the combat by one sword. And I go, do you have any tricks? No. Okay, end of the game. What do you got in your hand? I've got Spring the Trap in my hand. I'm like... It's just such a feels bad moment. This card is just, I think, I think it's the strongest intrigue in the game. Just because if you can take that tier seven combat away just by lifting two spies, that's a swing of minus four points for someone else and plus four for you. It's just, it's just bonkers. Margo, I mean, you can put your spy here and your spy, like two spies out on the blue spots with your signet ring and just go, eh, I'm done. I, I, I just have to do my signet ring and my spring the traps online now. Even this one here, five swords for one, which is just as like just fantastic value. <laughs> you can have a signet ring in your final draw and go, well, I've got my signet ring, I'll just play that, and this comes online. But other people scrambling, trying to get the espionage or, you know, hoping that some something like this has come up, like special mission. Uh, you don't have to do anything. You just have to play your signet ring. And, yeah, that's just such such a feels-good moment when that happens. Oh, yeah. I love going kind of, into those cards, especially early, because um, it's kind of like what you are saying before, being ready for that turn seven, making sure you have these spies down. If you have some time before these come out, you can actually prepare for it. Obviously, if you draw as like one of the last intrigues, it's a dead card. But, yeah, they are game-winning intrigue cards. 100%. And even this one here, we need to lift two spies. So, you know, there's plenty of combats come along, and you might have this intrigue in your hand, and this is a tier seven combat, and you're like, oh... I don't really want to play the five swords, but if I don't play the five swords, someone else might beat me because they might have more swords or something. I'll, I'll lift the spy, and then they're down to one spy, and they don't get the point. And and this one here especially, because you can't get um, you can't double the bottom reward with worms. You may only be sitting on eight or nine after this combat, where if you're Margo, you've got this and this in your hand. You're like, that's fine. I'll, I've got bonus spies coming up. I can I can use them, and I can um, push myself to ten. So um. Uh, yeah, it's just something else that Margo can do. Fade can do it too, to an extent. Um, Staban can do it as well. Anyone who generates spies. But if, if you're not one of those three leaders uh, and you're not able to generate the spies, these are just dead cards, which is just such a sad moment. Yeah, I will say this is probably my favorite Tier 3 combat because it just puts people in such awkward spots sometimes. Because even if you did the prep work to put a spy on Highliner, pulling that spy can cost you a point, which I think is an interesting... Uh, I don't know. It, it ends up creating a lot of interesting situations in the end, but... Um, yeah, I agree. Yeah. And Fade can sometimes get in awkward spots where even though they have the spy generation, they end up pulling them on reveal for combats, which can make it a little bit tough for them too. But yeah, Margo doesn't run into those issues like as much. No, and the Staban doesn't either. And that's why Staban yeah. is also a very good leader. Um, I think the downside to Staban is, well, you really need to draw faction access out of the row mm. or you're in all sorts of trouble. Um, <clears throat> and also with Staban, um, it's very 
depending on position, you need to be position one, Esteban. Um, sometimes position four, if you're planning an early revealing, I often do that, but typically position two and three, Esteban's not very good. So um, we might go, it doesn't really matter on your position. You know, you'll have the spies, you'll be fine. Okay. I don't have anything else. I don't know if you have anything else you'd like to say. Uh, I, I could talk forever about all this. I love it so much. <laughs> uh, Just it's yeah. so much fun. Um, but I, like I will say, if anyone's uh, you know wants to 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 hit me up, like just leave your message, uh, your comments uh, below, uh, and like I'm happy to jump in and answer any questions that anyone might have for me um, regarding Margo or regarding Uprising in general. Um, it's a, it's a passion of mine, Uprising, as it is for you as well. And uh, yeah, I, I'm just happy to to share the knowledge I've got on the game with anyone. Yeah, thank you, and thank you for joining me here today as well. You know. Um taking the time out of your day, discussing a lot of these uh, strategies that I'm sure help you a lot to win games, as you have seen. So it's really cool hearing your thoughts on Margo, someone you have so much experience with, and someone that I was uh, definitely sleeping on a lot. So I look forward to personally taking some of the information you've shared and using it in my own games. Yeah, I absolutely love sharing and uh, love uh, talking to you. It's always a pleasure, and I, uh, I hope we get to play some games soon.